Chapter 26 Zero Hour Dark Sparrow was still aiming a shotgun at the back of Tattoo Face's head. Jane was snoring noisily. Three, two, one. Where did the moon go? Cameron held his arms wide open. He was confused upon not seeing a full moon. Suddenly a gigantian red portal opened, gyrating counterclockwise, sucking with a powerful vacuum, dragging cars toward its black hole. The Chosen One has opened a portal. The Chosen One has slayed the legendary beast with his full-bladed sword. It is just as Marcus prophesied. Ruby cult-like mystics cheered religiously. Cameron turned around, facing his disciples. No, wait. It's a trap. All the ruby cult-like mystics flew while inmates jumped up, allowing the portal's black hole to take them away. In a moment of distraction, Tattoo Face jumped onto a motorbike as the portal's black hole took him away, leaving Cameron all alone. Dark Sparrow straddle jumped, grabbing Cameron's shoulders and wrapping her legs around him, executing a triangle choke. She did this while trying to break Cameron's visor with her combat knife. Meanwhile Maxwell Turner, the metallic amethyst elites, emerald dragon monks, and Julie's sapphire dragon riders organized arrests at Rubervale prison. Using excessive force against the ruby cult-like mystics, the dragon riders shoved the mystics into prison cells as the metallic amethyst elites cast inscriptions on runes, disabling all magic inside each cell. Go, Maxwell. My team has these guys under control. Julie winked. Then I'd better go now, Julie. Maxwell, that portal was a good plan. They check in, but they don't check out. Oh, and give Dark Sparrow a kiss for me. Meanwhile Dark Sparrow refused to let go of her grip. She popped out Cameron's visor with her combat knife. Cameron's armor began to shake as he dropped four bloodstones from his right wrist. Three of the bloodstones shattered on impact. Cameron channeled mana from his wrist into the only remaining bloodstone. Give up, Cameron, Dark Sparrow demanded, trying to gouge Cameron's eyes out. Maxwell came back through a red portal, tapping Jane's shoulder, trying to wake her up. A colossal purple portal opened, gyrating counterclockwise above the second bridge. A colossal ruby dragon stood on its hind legs, hyperextending its wings. The colossal ruby dragon had a heptagon-shaped head with no neck and six-foot-long black horns bursting out of all seven corners of its head. Its polished red body reflected a shiny bright light. I need to kill Cameron. Jane woke up screaming. Jane sprung up as Ruby breathed a wide, powerful flame, smothering a 50-foot section of the first bridge. Jane and Maxwell ran east toward a petrol tanker, soon realizing that it was not the best place to be. As they were running back in the other direction, cars exploded and light posts melted, engulfing the petroleum tanker in flames. Troy ran past the petroleum tanker just before it exploded loudly. Troy gave directives to everyone as he gasped for air. Leave Cameron to me. This is our fight to finish. As for everyone else, distract Ruby by any means necessary. Cameron killed my father. He is my catch, Dark Sparrow demanded while still trying to gouge Cameron's eyes out. Speaking in tongues, Cameron cast entangled vines, whipping Dark Sparrow's thighs, forcing her to lose her grip on him and drop her triangle chokehold. Maxwell grabbed Dark Sparrow's hand and spoke in tongues, casting Dispel putting an end to the entanglement spell. Ready to slay this dragon together. Jane pointed west. Sapphire is coming. My dragon is coming. Dark Sparrow, ride with me. Riding on Sapphire was Rapscallion Devil. Jane assisted Dark Sparrow as the two took arcane flight. Maxwell reached his hands toward the flames, absorbing fire in his right palm then sending out a stream of ice from his left palm. Ruby looked at Maxwell, who was standing on the first bridge. Ruby prepared another fire breath, this one aimed at Maxwell. Sapphire, I need you to allow Dark Sparrow to take the reins, Jane directed her large sapphire dragon. Dark Sparrow mounted Sapphire and held onto the reins with Rapscallion Devil sitting on her lap. Hold the reins between your pinky and ring fingers, and keep your thumbs up. 
Next time I'll teach you how to use a double rein. Dark Sparrow thought, maybe Jane is not a dimwit after all. Looking toward the bridge, she thought, what is Maxwell doing? Maxwell shouted in the Mandarin tongue, channeling Ruby's fire breath into his right palm and sending ice out from his left palm. Blizzard! Maxwell screamed, shaking his arms furiously. He pressed both arms toward Ruby, turning fire and rain into a nasty blizzard that covered the entirety of the second bridge. Ice covered Ruby's body as Maxwell fainted from mana exhaustion. I've got this dragon rider thing worked out. Forward, Sapphire, Dark Sparrow ordered. Flying into battle against the hundred-foot beast, Dark Sparrow avoided its wide bite radius. Each tooth measures three feet in length, so I'll be trigger-happy and hope for a lucky hit. Extending her arm toward Ruby, Dark Sparrow emptied her weapon of the last of its 9mm ammunition. Damn it, each bullet melted before it reached her. Jane cast two shadow clones, which intertwined their fingers to give her a boost into the air. She cast three more sets into the air to assist with more jumps. Jane pointed her finger forward, speaking in the French tongue, firing a red laser from her index finger. Arcane Sniper Slicing the side of Ruby's cheek and leaving a nasty tear, Jane landed on Ruby's head and wrapped herself around the top horn. Squatting then leg pressing, Jane tore out Ruby's horn. Jane dove off Ruby's head, landing next to Maxwell, where she kneeled in a sprinter's position and channeled electricity around her body, directing it to the strongest point of the horn. I am proud of you, Jane. Maxwell gasped for air. Dark Sparrow noticed that Ruby was targeting Jane and Maxwell, preparing another fire breath. Rapscallion, take the reins, will you? Dark Sparrow threw her fanny pack onto the first bridge. It landed near Troy and Cameron. Yo, Ruby, Dark Sparrow shouted, jumping off Sapphire while unloading 65 9mm rounds to distract Ruby. Then she prepared to dive into the Tyson River. Ruby didn't realize in the moment of distraction that Jane had generated electricity on the horn's tip. Jane then flew away fast, executing the horn as a kamikaze spear that penetrated the bottom of Ruby's left eye. Ruby growled, vigorously breathing fire, hoping for a lucky hit. Dark Sparrow took a deep breath. Closing her eyes, she remained calm while diving into the Tyson River, making only a small splash. Dark Sparrow swam freestyle toward the Ruby Mana Tower. Once she reached it, she climbed out of the river. Maxwell stood up, speaking in the Hungarian tongue, casting an enlargement spell. Ruby's horn grew to twice its size and sliced her eye near the pupil. Curse you, Ruby growled darkly, spitting fireballs wildly. Sapphire breathed her ice beam, casing the thorn in ice. Meanwhile Troy and Cameron were fighting, forcefully exchanging heavy blows. Troy kept in close to Cameron, hammer-fisting him and breaking down his cyborg armor. Inserting fingers into the gap where his visor was holding on tightly while delivering heavy hammer-fist blows and high knee kicks, Troy tore off the helmet. Troy dove backward and bobbed down, avoiding Cameron's straight punch. Swinging upward, Troy struck Cameron's chest then stepped in closer, bashing the helmet against Cameron's torso. Troy stepped back, conserving his breath, waiting for Cameron to move toward him. As Cameron began to speak in tongues, casting an entanglement spell, Troy used the helmet as an extension to his back fist and struck Cameron's forearm. Wrapped by several vines, Cameron punched into Troy's abdomen as metal gashed his skin. Squeezing his muscles tightly, Troy flexed, tearing the entanglement spell's vines. Going for a takedown, Troy grabbed Cameron's left arm at the elbow, delivering a left front kick then springing off his right foot to shin kick the back of Cameron's head. Following his attack past Cameron's head, Troy squeezed in closer, executing a flying arm bar. Cameron screamed as his bicep tightened and his elbow hyperextended. Troy pressed his legs together and raised his hips, hyperextending Cameron's arm 230 degrees. Cameron cried out with the unbearable pain as his humerus, ulna, and radius bones broke. Removing another piece of armor, Troy let the submission go. Either you give up or your dragon gives up. 
Cameron whispered in tongues, casting divine magic slowly trying to repair his broken arm. Cameron removed his armor and grabbed a small chrome canister from a hidden compartment behind the sternum. Injecting chemicals into his biceps, he waited as his bloodstream absorbed the tonic. Fair fight, man to man. The mystic with perfected drugs versus the mixed martial artist afraid to strike true. You have lost everything, including your wife, yet you still cannot kill me, Cameron teased scornfully. I won't kill you because I would rather you rot in jail after all the lives you've ruined. Janet Munson's blog blames Alyssa's death squarely on you. If you were a true warrior, you would strike true if Alyssa meant anything to you. After all, it was Alyssa who had Nigel tell bedtime stories to David. Cameron rubbed his body inappropriately. Bastard. Troy rushed Cameron angrily. Cameron high-kneed Troy under his jaw, following this up with a flurry of blows to his pectoral. Gasping for air, Troy was winded. I invoked my power. Now you will bow down before me. Cameron pointed to his feet. Troy noticed Dark Sparrow's fanny pack and the stolen miniature electrical magnetic pulse generator. I hadn't noticed until now, but Cameron has a pacemaker. Arlo, you were right, this is my fight and for my fellow nerves. This is our fight, and it ends now. Arlo delivered six consecutive right hooks to the diamond mana tower, splintering a hand-sized section. It's still too tough. I don't know how to get rid of this. Neither do I have enough mystics available to perform a mass summoning. Trinity asked, what is the final component you're after? Hawken placed his hands onto the tower, absorbing its psionic energy. Get any pure silver or gemstones that you can so I may deposit this mana into them. A female police officer handed over a silver brooch, while a male cop raised his hand. I have a vast collection of silver spoons on the third floor. I also have a collection of fashionable jewellery embedded with real gemstones. Arlo lay flat in the middle of the street, exhausted. What is your plan, original cleric? Arlo asked as his teeth chattered. I will convert the psionic mana into divine mana. The diamond will lose more of its density, making it as frail as glass. I'll store the excess mana, then Trinity will open a portal, sending the mana elsewhere, preventing a flood of this strange slime. Meanwhile in Emerald, the land of peace, Edward comforted all the children. You are special, you are meaningful, and you have a special purpose to live back home in Nankin City. It is time for everyone to return home thanks to your local hero Dark Sparrow. Elsewhere, Queen Vedic and Leviticus continued to fight Nigel Giovanni and a huge gorilla folk wielding a war hammer. Taking cover behind marble pillars outside the courthouse, Leviticus whispered, I am trying to cast a scan to find weaknesses, but each time I try to focus, he shoots. The huge gorilla folk ran toward Leviticus with a mighty swing, taking out a marble pillar. Leviticus ran behind another pillar, avoiding the bullets from Nigel's magnum. Vedic formed a small psionic ball of pure energy levitating in place. Moving inside the courthouse, she formed yet more small psionic balls of pure energy, hiding each ball underneath a seat or behind a statue. Telekinetically slamming doors, she hid more small psionic balls of pure energy. Telekinetically opening the double doors, she waited for Nigel to enter the courthouse foyer. Where did he go? Queen Vedic spoke to Nigel telepathically. You are only a sacrificial pawn. Who put you up to this? Nigel imagined Vedic dressed as a queen inside a dungeon experiencing all kinds of sick sexual acts, reversing the effects of her telepathy. Luckily you don't know psionics, you sick bastard. Fight me inside the courthouse, Nigel, Queen Vedic demanded telepathically. The huge gorilla folk barged through the wall, making its own entrance. Queen Vedic stepped back, creating distance between herself and the creature, while concentrating her mind on the war hammer. Triple jumping using triangular footwork, the gorilla folk swung upward in a circular motion, striking Queen Vedic's left latissimus dorsi muscle and snapping six of her ribs, which pierced her left lung. Then the gorilla folk launched back and crash-landed as Vedic Jones hit her ribs against the bulletproof glass. I can't breathe. 
broken ribs. Nigel stood over Queen Vedic, pointing his magnum at her head. Checkmate. The game is set now that my pawns have slayed your dragon and sedated your Syangan allies in courtroom 3. And I shot down plenty of your metallic amethyst elites. I enjoyed killing Hoarfrost by blowing her brains out. Nigel licked his magnum flirtatiously. As for Cameron, he promised me a Syangan brain so I too could learn to read minds. You know what I will do when I read minds? Exploit everyone's deepest, darkest secret, including your deepest, darkest secret. Unable to breathe or heal, Vedic realized that death was inevitable. She looked lifelessly at the huge gorilla folk and Nigel. Little did they realize that Queen Vedic was looking at the gorilla folk's loincloth and a set of gold-plated veneers covering Nigel's teeth. Psionically imbuing both items with her mind, Vedic, with her last seconds of life, silently enchanted both items. Tremors were felt through the ground, and the air felt heavier. I hear reinforcements are coming. Get ready to kill, Nigel said fearfully and overanimatedly. Telekinetically speaking, Queen Vedic said, you have won the battle, but you've lost the war. Suicide mana magnetic attraction. This is my final judgment. May your soul rest in peace. Within a radius of 100 feet, psionic energy quickly impacted Nigel's gold veneers and the huge gorilla folk's groin. Vedic's mana drained from her body, pressing Nigel against the ceiling above. As Nigel fell, the courtroom doors opened. Confiscated magical weapons impaled him and the huge gorilla folk worse than a pincushion. In courtroom 3, Syangans were drained of their psionic mana nodes as the mana was sent from two floors above, grinding them into a whirlpool very deep underground. Nigel belongs deeper than the Kola super deep borehole. Vedic whimpered painfully while speaking her dying words. Her mana nodes were torn out, instantly severing every vital system in her body. One minute later, as the air cleared, Leviticus, Julie, and Desmond walked in. Rest in peace, my queen. Leviticus held her against his chest. Dr. Axel Chase used the vacuum heat pipe cannon on the NEV fire truck to absorb mana from the Topaz mana tower. Don't worry, dad. This will work, Scott reassured his father, observing from the control panel. Dr. Chase took a moment to admire his son's confidence. After 30 seconds, I estimate 1,000 lumens, compared to 4,000. This tower won't be a threat anymore. Meanwhile the crews of the two NEV marine boats and the police boat continued to follow Troy's earlier directives. Two vacuum heat pipes drained the Ruby Mana Tower quickly. Ruby hovered above the river between the Ruby Mana Tower and the NEV marine boats. Three police officers shot six harpoons simultaneously. Ruby was impaled by eleven piercings through her right wing, causing her to drop, making a colossal splash. Several of the crew members fell overboard as Ruby breathed fire, creating dense steam. You guys killed the squid. Now finish off the dragon, Dark Sparrow shouted as she noticed something much larger than colossal size swimming underneath. Leviathan, shouted many eyewitnesses. Leviathan opened its colossal-sized jaw, trapping Ruby's neck between its teeth and dragging her upstream. Dark Sparrow gasped as Leviathan, the universe's strongest creature, twisted its mighty body, leaving Nankin City upstream. Cameron froze in fear once he saw how powerless he was compared to Leviathan. I thought picking a fight with Leviathan was a good idea. Cameron dropped to his knees. He was petrified and sweating profusely. Cameron was tongue-tied as he was driven to madness. Troy grabbed Cameron by the wrist, pressing his back against his chest, and pushed his hip outward. Launching Cameron into the air with his signature hip throw, Troy slammed his adversary hard on the road. Troy reached for Dark Sparrow's bag and grabbed the miniature electrical magnetic pulse generator, clicking the button as he pressed it against Cameron's chest. Cameron no longer resisted and was not fighting back. Instantly Cameron became lifeless. Everyone there knew Cameron Banks had died because his pacemaker, cybernetic heart, cybernetic lungs, and hearing aid device had all shut down simultaneously. 
Sapphire, Jane, and Max will join Troy as Dark Sparrow rushed to perform CPR. No, he didn't have to die. Live, damn you. Clenching her hands together, she pressed into Cameron's chest, thumping him hard. Jane kneeled next to Cameron. I can do compressions while you give mouth to mouth. I killed Cameron. I am not afraid of prison because of what I chose to do. Cameron is a villain who terrorizes Nankin City, which the city does not need, Troy explained honestly. Damn it, damn it, Cameron is dead, Dark Sparrow growled angrily, slapping Cameron's face. Jane empathized. You have grown in the last week since I met you. Even though Cameron has done so much wrong, I see your heart has become forgiving. Jane smiled, hugging Dark Sparrow as Troy and Maxwell kneeled beside her. I lost my wife last week to this man, yet I can't change what has happened. And justice is just an individual's bullshit interpretation. However, I have my son, my father, my good friends, and the Nankin emergency volunteers. My friends are my family. Troy whimpered, trying to hold back his tears. Maxwell pecked a kiss on Dark Sparrow's cheek. After all of this, we have met and enjoyed a wonderful first date. If you are keen, Dark Sparrow, I would like to take you out for a coffee. Maxwell kissed Dark Sparrow several times. Come on, Dark Sparrow. It has been a crazy week, but it hasn't been all for nothing. So besides dating my dad, do you have anything you would like to say? Any words of wisdom, seeing as your strangulation charges against Cameron will be dropped. Jane said. Dark Sparrow clenched her fists to her side. Seeing as Cameron is dead, I cannot collect my full bounty as promised. In a moment of silence, everyone grimaced, including all volunteers on the NEV marine boats. Then they laughed at Dark Sparrow's comment. Maxwell Turner, yes, I will go on a date with you and enjoy a work of art coffee over a piccolo anytime, Dark Sparrow replied flirtatiously.